Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. Hey, do me a favor. If you're on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that bell for the notifications. And if you're listening on Spotify, make sure you do that five star. Hey guys, if you can't get up in the morning and you need to pick me up, I'm telling you now, blackout coffee. The coffee for America's warriors. That's right, America's warriors. It's the be awake, don't be woke coffee. Tons of flavors, great taste, amazing coffee. So go to www.blackoutcoffee.com and at checkout, punch in everyday BS. That's right, everyday BS. So get yourself some. Today's guest is a good friend of mine I've known for years and retired Marine Master Gunnery Sergeant Ed Briggs. Ed, thanks so much, brother, for doing this. I deeply appreciate it. So, a meritory service medal, two Navy comms, five NAMs, combat action, 10 good conducts. Yep. That's a lot, man. That's a big <laughs> resume right there, huh, brother? Yeah, a little bit. You, how many years total? 30. 30 years, 30 years man. Yeah. 30 years. How old were you when you got in? 17. Right out of high school? Yeah, parents had a sign. Really? Where'd you grow up? Grew up in a little town close to Buffalo called Dunkirk, New York. Yeah? In between Erie, Pennsylvania and Buffalo. Oh, Erie. Up by that water, man. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> man. Right by the lake. Hell yeah, brother. A lot of family involved in the military? Uh, No, not really. No? no? My brother was in the Army. My uncle was in the Army. You see all this bullshit on TV, you know, all the crap that's going on at these schools and, and whatnot. When I was when I was growing up, you know, military was a lot of a lot of kids looked forward to doing. They they looked forward to like, hey man, I'm getting out of school. What are you gonna do? Well, I'm gonna go join the Marines, I'm gonna join the Army, I'm going in the Navy, I'm doing something. You know, because they wanted that camaraderie, they wanted that brotherhood, and they wanted some type of education and they knew they could get it through the service. Nowadays, I mean, we see a lot of bullshit on the outserts of uh, schools. It seems like kids today, man, they just they don't want to put the effort in and join. What do you think about shit like that? Um, it seem like they are entitled and want something for nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I. I don't know, man. I think it's the cell phones. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think a lot of it's got to do with uh, cell phones and just the way shit is today. Um, my, I grew up, my grandfather was military. Um, my wife's family has a lot of military also. Um, you knew Uncle Gene, mm -hmm. a good friend of yeah. ours, and yeah. he was uh, Navy, you know. But uh, being... 30 years, man, in the Marines. Dude, that's a long freaking time, bro. Yeah, it went by quick, though. It went by quick? Yeah. You miss it? No. No? Well, it's my time. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. You uh, you do a lot of uh, hookups with your brothers from from when you were in, right? A yeah, lot we've of, done like... a couple of reunions already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, where do you travel for that? The first one was for the Battle of Anasuria, and we went, it was in Fort Worth, Texas for that reunion. Oh, no, no, no. I take it back. The first one was in Quantico, uh, Virginia. That was the first reunion with Pena. And the 15 was at, uh, in Fort Worth, Texas. You've got combat um, on your resume. Um, how old were you when you first went and they said, all right, get your shit together? We're going somewhere, and it's it's time. Oh, geez, that was uh, well in 2003. So I can't remember what how old that was then. It was how many years ago? So, Shit, that, man. 21. 21 years ago. So I would have been in my 30s. Yeah. 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 So that was uh, Iraq. Yeah, that was the, the initial invasion of Iraq in 2003. Yeah. Damn, man. That was first time for combat for me, anyway. Yeah. I didn't make it to Desert Storm. I didn't get there. That one was too short. <laughs> yeah <laughs> got a lot of friends that were there 
during that invasion and whatnot. What was your MOS? What was your job title? I was you artillery. In? Oh, shit. The cop room. So I was actually on the run in the gun line. What was going through your mind when you got these orders? Nothing really. We just had to hurry up and pack everything up and get ready. We went over on by ship, so. Okay. Uh, it took us a while. You know, we have to load all the ships up and everything, the gear, and the trek across the Atlantic Ocean. That took two weeks. No shit, two weeks. I couldn't make, dude. I don't know. I always said if I couldn't, you know, if I could go back in the service, I'd go back in the Navy. But I don't know, man. I get seasick, dude. I was fortunate. I didn't get seasick at all. No. Yeah. I they just, load you down with Dramamine? No, I didn't, I didn't need any of that. I just laugh at people that were seasick. Really? <laughs> well, they didn't want to do anything. Yeah. You know, you're nauseous. You don't want to do nothing. Nothing, <laughs> dude. You're like, it's shit, man. Holy shit. But so you're on a boat. You got two weeks on a boat. What uh? What car? What what were you guys on? What uh? Do you remember what ship? I was on a LPD five. That was a USS Pecan. How many guys on that on that on that boat? Uh, well, they split up our whole battalion between six different ships. So, uh, marine wise on that on that boat. Well, we had the infantry with us on that one because that was the biggest boat out of the whole arg that went over there. Um, it wasn't, it's slightly smaller than an aircraft carrier, not quite as big as an aircraft carrier. It's one style down, I guess you could say. Mm. But uh, we had our whole battery on there, which was almost 200 people. And then I don't know how, I can't remember how many infantry men were on there. Whatnot. But they just had to split everybody up to get everybody over there on it. No and then we had six ships. Really. No shit. Damn, man. I just couldn't picture like that many people on a fucking. Well, I don't know, man. You we go on cruises now, you know. <laughs> yeah. there's, it's, there's nothing to do on a military ship. Yeah. So clean your rifle, clean your guns. And then we had a lot of classes to prep us for what to expect over there. Yeah, I, 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 I could just imagine like the, uh, the breakdown of shit of what you guys were about to go through and understand. So I'm sure that they're like, okay. This is it, man. This is what we're going in. This is what we're going to do. And here's a breakdown of what's going to what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, we all kind of knew what to do because, you know, you train for all that. And that's why you go on the floats, the Mediterranean floats or the Westpac floats. And it's the same process. You're loading up a ship and you're going somewhere. Can you explain the floats to some people that may not know? Or floats, understand? There's one that leaves out of California. It's the, called the Westpac. It goes over to the, the western side of the world. And then uh, <clears throat> the Mediterranean float, you'd leave from Camp Lejeune and you, you go over to the Mediterranean Sea and you, you, they have planned field operations in different countries. <clears throat> Those are usually six months in duration. Six months? How how often would you guys do those? There's a, there's a group over there every, all the time. Really? Yeah. So there's already one over there in the Mediterranean. And, and they're getting ready to come home and we're going. So, and we meet at Road of Spain and that's where we do the change out. So there's always a presence in the Mediterranean, uh, 365 days a year. So. Damn. You, so you guys, you get to, where do you, where do you guys dock when you get overseas? Well, they, they schedule them, of course, they're scheduled years in advance because you got to pay all the, you know, the pier fee and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So we do the change out in Road of Spain. And then uh, you go through the Straits of Gibraltar, and then we, we stopped at uh, just about every country in the Mediterranean. Damn. That's wild. So you got all your guys on the ship. You guys are heading overseas. You got a two-week journey. You're being debriefed. You're taking classes. They're filling your mind with all kinds of shit. Like, okay, what's going to happen? Where do you guys um, dock when you get there? Well, we, I rode to Spain. Okay. In Rota. And then from there, what, how do you get to, are you, you going to Kuwait first? Oh, no, no. When, when, all right. When, no, for a float, you, you, you change over and row to Spain. Now, for when we went over to Iraq for the initial mm -hmm. invasion thing, we didn't do that change over there. We went straight through the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal, and into the Persian Gulf. Okay. And then we disembarked in, in Kuwait. Yeah. And then we drove to a, a predetermined uh, position close to the border of Iraq and uh, uh, in Kuwait. Shit. And we waited for the, for the order to go. 
So and there was a bunch of different little uh, camps that were set up for different units. And ours was, it was uh, Camp Shoop. was ours. Camp Shoop? Yeah, it was named after uh, Shoop the General. Um, and it's just a spot in the desert where we set up a whole bunch of tents and we slept in the tents and got all our gear ready and waited for the call. I talked to a couple buddies. First impression when you got there. What was your first impression? That there's so much money over there, yet they live in squalor. Unless you're the big uh, sheiks, everybody else lives in shitholes. Yeah. There's garbage everywhere. Really? Yeah. 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 I just couldn't believe that there's that much money and oil there, and the populace lives like shit. No shit, yeah. man. I, I, I don't, I don't know, man. It's it, the whole weapons of mass destruction, the controlling of oil and whatnot. Um, I know I just had a podcast with a buddy of mine. Uh, he was air force and Kirkirk. He was at, just outside of the, I guess, um, the oil fields mm -hmm. and shit up there. And he said it was, it was pretty, pretty gnarly. And, you know, I talked to a couple other vets that were over there and just the way that some of these, I guess, people lived were just, it was mind blowing. You know, you got guys fighting with no shoes right. and, and shit like that. I mean, you see this as a soldier from the States What's what's going through your head, you know, when you're over there? Well, I was glad they didn't have very much. Yeah, <clears throat> it was our, our our initial airstrike is what what got them really bad. It, you know, uh, our airstrikes just totally annihilated any uh, threats that would be to us immediate threats anyway. And then, um, so that was pretty easy, I thought, because we didn't have to worry about too much. But then once you got into the towns. And everybody was dressed like a civilian. So you didn't know who the bad guy was. Yeah. So that was the worst part there. You didn't know if it was a regular citizen or just an Iraqi soldier dressed in civilian clothes. Sure. You didn't, you couldn't tell. So you had to just assume they're all combatants. Now, seeing that, how, how did you guys adapt to figuring out who was who? We didn't, it was as our, on, the, on the initial invasion, us as artillery, we didn't have to worry too much about that because we were doing our mission and shooting the howitzers. <clears throat> we weren't necessarily patrolling the streets in the towns. Okay. Uh, that came afterwards. So the initial uh, tour that we were there, we were mainly just, uh, we were artillery. We weren't doing that. We would do local little, uh, local security patrols, but for the main part, we weren't going house to house, not artillery. Infantry were doing all that shit. So you were getting now that uh, changed afterwards, years down the road. That all those years that we were there, there wasn't much need for artillery. We had some out there, but not or they didn't have you know both East Coast and West Coast artillery in Iraq. Hmm. Just a couple of battery, battery here, a battery there. So then we became provisional infantry or uh, MP companies. We would patrol do convoys and things of that nature. And then we were going into towns. We always had to be on the ball. How long, how long in before you got your first call in? I'm like, hey, shell the shit out of this section. Oh, we were coming up on this uh, little town of Anazaria. We were just in convoy going towards uh, Baghdad. And uh, once the infantry got into Nazaria, and they were going over to the other, the, on the other side of the town, the North Bridge, then they got uh, ambushed. It was both, uh, right in the middle of a town called Ambush Allen, and that's when the shit hit the fan. We were just driving down the road, and we got called a, a fire mission, which we call it a hasty in place when it hits you. We just pull off on the roads, point our guns in the general direction with the azimuth of fire that we're given, and then we wait for a fire mission and start shooting. Yeah. So that was that one was, uh, and we practice that in training. We're, they're called hip shoots. We shoot them from the hip, basically. Or yeah. Pull off right there. We'll do our little fast calculations with the azimuth to fire. And then with our adjustment rounds, we get to the uh, target. Oh, man, I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine, man, just like 
cruising down a road and then all of a sudden you get that call. It's yeah, like, you got, hey. and you got only a couple minutes to get set up and shoot, you know, three minutes, five minutes, something like that. I can't remember all the time hacks anymore. But uh and you got it because at that time frame our, our grunts were getting mortared and shot at. And yeah, we had to stop them. We had you know uh our FOs had to call fire for the, the mortar position. So our guys were getting killed and we had to hurry up and go and get rounds down range quickly. Rounds down range. How long did you spend over there during that first deployment? The first one was uh I don't know, about six months yeah. before we they got Baghdad once that was all secured and everything, and then they started sending us home. Wait, so did did you personally get into Baghdad yourself? No, no, not, not on the first trip. I never made it to Baghdad. We just got as far as uh, El Kut. So six month rotation for you. A lot of your guys went through that as well. You know, being over there six months and then yeah, the first group was over there six or eight months. I can't remember the exact times without looking at my, my notes from that I have at home, but uh, both you know the the West Coast and you know the first our, the first ones that got there. Then we started going home, and then all the other people were coming. So you you get back to the states after over being over there for six months. How how are things for you when you get back? Business is normal for us. We just started back to do our normal training cycle. Well, they gave us vacation time. Oh, did they? Yeah, yeah. We got as soon as well. You have to go through a little week long debrief uh, classes. You know, making sure everything's good to go, and you're back in the civilian community. And uh, then you could go on leave. They just didn't let you go on leave right away. Yeah. Well, first of all, we stopped at on our way back. Well, uh, once we switched out with the other unit that was coming in, we they, we stopped at Portugal, Spain, and had liberty there. Oh yeah. Yeah, because they wanted us to blow off steam before they released us back at their home. <laughs> <laughs> all right, boys. Yeah, we gotta let these guys drink some beer and shit before we yeah. send them home. <laughs> oh man. I, I was talking to uh, a buddy of mine, Chad, who was, I was telling you about, it was the Air Force, and uh, I guess it, he was a, um, his job title, he was like a, a, a welder for aircraft and whatnot, and when he got over there, you know, I asked him, I was like, did you go right into Kuwait? He's like, no, man. He's like, oh, we landed in Ireland. Shannon, Ireland was the first stop. He's like, that's where you, you land when you first, on your way over. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no shit. And he's like, yeah, man. He's like, fucking bars are open. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight o'clock in the morning, man. You don't have to worry. There's a bar open to blow some steam and get some drinks in you. And before you head on, head on out. You yeah, know? that was the, the stop for <clears throat> about every unit that went over there. Was Shannon, Ireland? Yeah, Ireland? yeah. Uh, we did, you know the first uh, deployment we went over on ships, so we didn't stop there. But, right. Um, on our my second and third one, we, yeah, we all stop at Shannon, Ireland. They let us drink in in, uh, in the airport there until our flight when we got on our flight and left. Oh yeah, man. That's. There, I wonder if there's like some. Is there any type of like totem over there where a bunch of you guys can? There so, might be now, but it wasn't <laughs> when I went. <laughs> okay, so. All right, so you're back home, you know, you get debriefed and debunked and all that good stuff and whatnot. So what's on your agenda now that you're stateside for a while? Well, I was you're back in your normal rotation of training. They have a you know an annual training schedule and it's planned years out. So uh, ours was to go right into cold weather training. Okay. So here we come from the 130 degree desert heat, and now we're up in uh, Bridgeport. No, we went to Norway first, so we were at like minus 20 outside so you're from one you know one extreme to another yeah and uh and that training was about five weeks long i think then we came back to camp Lejeune into the heat and then we went up to bridgeport california for uh three months of cold weather training wow where you're hiking up and down the skagum mountain you go up there you do some training and then you come down and relax for a week maybe and then you go back up there and it all culminates to this war at the end it's usually what it is let's let's fast forward a little bit on your your career in the marines is there 
you you said uh you did some recruiting too where are you stationed for that uh in uh new hampshire and maine really yeah kittery maine is where uh, uh portsmouth new hampshire is where our recruiting head office was out of and then they split you up from there in my areas was Fort Smith, New Hampshire, and, and Kittery, Maine area. That's where a lot of my schools were at. That, that I was responsible for. How, how long did you do that? Gig three, for three years. Ooh, yeah. three miserable years. It was terrible. I hated it. I I uh, I had a buddy of mine who was a recruiter, former drill instructor, recruiter. Um, he hated it. He hated it. I mean. You got to keep up the numbers. You got to yep. keep, you know, the the constant calls out to students in high school and meeting of parents. And and I, I could just imagine your your phone calls from parents coming back to you. Leave my kid alone. Oh, yeah. Blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. I've even had a lot of them. They say, oh, it's great what you're doing. You know, thank you for ser serving our country, but not my kid. Yeah. That's, that's, that's up in Maine. They're all. Pretty much up there. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh shit, man. But yeah, I, I wanted to go to be a drill instructor, so I put a, a, a request to be a drill instructor. But at that point, I was a sergeant, and we had too many sergeants out of my job field that were out doing other things. Mm -hmm. So they turned me down. Well, then shortly after that, I got selected for staff sergeant. And of course, <clears throat> we had plenty of staff sergeants. Uh, around so they would let me go but they let me go for recruiting duty and not drill instructor so oh. i flagged myself and <laughs> but got the wrong duty <laughs> so let, let me ask you this because i've heard this um i i found this hilarious and uh you always keep an extra rank in your pocket because you never know when you're going to get demoted oh no <laughs> that, was, that, that wasn't me. <laughs> that wasn't you. No, no. That, that's that's a good thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I just I I personally, uh, Blake, I couldn't imagine. You know, I mean, you work so hard to get to where you're going, and why the hell would you want to get demoted? You know. Yeah. Um. So three years, man. That's you know up in the New England area, right? And. I just, I mean, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't do that, man. I couldn't, you know, I, I, I give you props for, for doing that. Yeah, but if you, if you don't have a successful tour, your, your, your career in the military is done. Yeah. They won't let you in if, if you didn't get a successful tour on recruiting duty. So it was either make it or break it. And at that point, I had been in the Marine Corps for 15 years. No shit. So it was only five more till I was eligible to retire. So, you know, but that all could have been washed down the tubes and nothing if I didn't have a successful tour of recruit duty. Wow. All right. So oh five you go back to Iraq. Yep. How was that? That was a, a pretty very interesting tour. Uh because we were a uh we, we did convoys. Okay. So uh we, it was a 60 man detachment and one uh one convoy of six Humvees would uh escort the, the division CG general uh, around, and then another six vehicles of uh, up-armored Humvees that would uh, escort the uh, assistant division commander, which was a, a one-star general, um, a brigadier general. So I was uh, I was originally supposed to just go over there to be the admin guy. To, the, the, I was a master sergeant at the time at E8, and I was supposed to be acting like the first sergeant, take care of all the, the needs of the, the 60 Marine detachment that we had. And uh, that was just supposed to be my, my job. I probably never would have left the FOB, the little base we were in, Blue Diamond. Uh, but that didn't work out that way. Our, our one uh, convoy commander, which was a, a lieutenant, he got injured back right two weeks before we uh, deployed. Mm. So he couldn't go. So we went anyways. And then uh, the, the general, the brigadier general, said, hey, you got a master sergeant over there, right? And the captain said, yeah. He goes, uh, well, he'll do. So then they made me the convoy commander. So I was leaving the base every day, driving in uh, downtown Ramadi or to Fallujah, and people were getting shot at every day down there, both of those places. Yeah. So we just our job was is to be the convoy 
to get the general from point A to point B without getting killed. <laughs> the stories of Ramadi are are rough. Oh yeah. I mean, I've listened to a lot of stories about Ramadi and and whatnot. I just I I couldn't imagine. You know, I don't have any combat. I was always stateside. And I give you guys mad props for everything. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything you guys have done over there. Um, but you end up being in charge of convoy and running out every day. Yeah. Holy we shit. We called it the run in the streets. Run in the streets. <laughs> It was really, you know, just like NASCAR out there. We had these Humvees, up armored Humvees, and we were going as fast as we could. We went seventy miles an hour down through the through the town where it's normally fifteen hour, fifteen mile an hour speed limit. Point A to point B, we ain't stopping anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we got signs on there: you better get out of our way, or we'll make you get out of the way. Shit, man. So, how many? How many cars in general in your convoy? It was six. Six? Unless occasionally there might be another vehicle or two in there. Sometimes we have to escort the mayor of Ramadi back to his house. Really? They don't want to kill him. No shit. They wanted to kill anybody that was for the liberation of uh, Iraq. And so they were always out to get him. So we escorted him home. But then I didn't pretty much like that convoy very well because we had two Mercedes in our convoy. Well, guess who's in that thing? You know? Yeah. We're flagging where the guy is at. I didn't like that at all, but uh, our general insisted that uh, we, we escort the mayor home that day. And we never, we weren't, we didn't go in that part of town. Yeah. But we did that day. What, what kind of daily conflict did you encounter while doing this? Oh, IEDs. And then once you once your stuff gets blown up by an IED, then there's people in the house that start shooting at you. Mm -hmm. We only had oh, fortunately we only uh, had a couple of those incidences because whenever we went out on a convoy, it was the route was pre-planned. Everybody knew, uh, marine-wise, where we were going, and and uh, they would do a, a, a pre-sweep of the area. Because mm. they knew we had generals in the Humvees, so they they would sweep the area for uh, as best they could. You right. know, they'd sweep the route with uh, IED protection devices that we had, and then we'd have some air that would be flying around. They they knew where we were going, so we would always have help if we really needed it. Yeah. Jesus, man. The. How long were you there for that? That that that. Well, that tour? was a six-month. Uh, Another six-month. Six yeah. And then you six had six to eight months were the the, the <clears throat> those kind of tours. And, okay. Well, no, wait, sorry. That no, that was a year. It was a year. Yeah. yeah. A year long for that kind of white one. And then another another unit came, and then you do the switch over with them. Hmm. And then you end up one more tour over there in 07. Same, 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 same job. Yeah, but much, much uh, grander scale. Um, we had eleven hundred Marines. Okay. This time, eleven hundred. Two of them were uh, reserve units that were activated, um, and that came with us. So we were all one big unit. We we did all the convoys for the you know, Al Assad area, but we would go anywhere in Iraq. But we were based out of Al Assad Air Base, which is close to Baghdad. And then my job was to be this the convoy supervisor guy. I would just ride around the whole country, fly and ride around it, and ride along with the convoys just to make sure everything's going the way it's supposed to be and everybody's following the proper procedures of what to do. And then I would just fix anything that, you know, that they might be taking a shortcut or something or whatever. Yeah. So I traveled all, all over Iraq the whole, that whole year. Just... I was never in the same place for very long. That was good. It made the time go by quick. Yeah. And then I got to go see everybody. I got to see all my, all my buddies that were out there. <laughs> the, as time goes on and, you know, your different tours over there, 
is the conflict in your eyes, do you see it diminishing a little bit? Like from being there from in 05 to 07, is there a big difference in the conflict? Oh, yeah. Stuff is uh, starting to be cleaned up. The town is being cleaned up. They were building, you know, redoing the roads, fixing the buildings. You know, it was starting to look like a, you know, like a nice place. Yeah. You know, of course, you did have your spots where they didn't want Americans around, but at the end of the day. Yeah. I... It wasn't that bad, at least not for what I was doing. I didn't have any serious problems. I, man, the majority of guys that I've talked to, you know, there, there were a lot of Iraqis that were happy to see you guys. And then, you know, you have that bunch, you know, get the fuck out, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, I just, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, you hear about the way that they, you know, they would use women and children as pretty much human shields yeah. and shit like that. Did you personally ever encounter anything like that on your time over there? No, no, because I was doing convoy stuff. We were point A to point B. We weren't walking around through towns and stuff. Yeah. We were driving through them. Um, I, I didn't have to do any patrols out in the town and stuff anyway. How, how, you know, I know a while there in the very beginning, you know, shit wasn't as on a good quality on the vehicles, armor wise, as time went on. How well were your, your vehicles fitted for armor and well, well, penetration? Well, in the initial invasion, we didn't have any. Uh, nothing was armor. Most, you know, the doors were plastic. Jesus the, Christ. The, the, the canvas on the Humvees and the trucks are just plastic, you know, canvas. Mm. And so not that we would take, we brought the, the, the weights from the ship, the, like the 45 and the 35 pound plates, and we would put them on the floorboards. So if an IED blew up, at least we had that metal plate that would uh, hopefully stop some of the uh, shrapnel. Right. But that, yeah, that's, that's all we had. We didn't get any up armor until my second tour. And we everybody had armor, everything. Yeah, I uh, I know some of the stories of uh, loading up sandbags and putting them on the floor oh, yeah. and, and oh, shit yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, we had that. That was, that was the times. <laughs> that was the times, yeah. brother. <laughs> what are you doing, Ed? I'm stuffing sandbags, yeah. baby. <laughs> well, and at the one base we were at when you uh, when we went to Chow, in order for them to get sandbags filled, they'd have a big pile of sand there. Mm -hmm. And a big pile of sandbags, and you had to fill two sandbags before they let you go in the chow hall and eat. No shit. <laughs> yeah. And you know you got everybody in line to go eat, so you know you'll get some sandbags filled pretty yeah. quick. How many guys are in line to eat, you know? Man, those lines are, you know, forever. Um, speaking of food over there, uh, you know, I hear different stories and stuff like that, and, you know, the whole they had to ration off certain things that they had and whatnot. How, how well were you and your boys taken care of when it came down to proper, proper food and, we and had, whatnot? We had plenty. We planned properly. I mean, I, I, I did my first, I, I, I did a very good job at that. It's battery gunny. My first time over there, I, I brought everything. Yeah. And people were coming to me for stuff, other units, because they found out I had my shit together. And, you didn't have but, no jelly donuts in your yeah, foot yeah, locker, did you? Stuff. I mean, <laughs> uh, I brought a whole quadcon full of cots. My boys weren't sleeping on the ground. Yeah. Not in the damn desert. And then everybody wanted to be my buddy after they found out I had cots. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> they didn't think to bring them. So we were prepared. The chow wasn't the best. You had to eat MREs three times a day. Yeah. We didn't start getting hot chow, you know. I mean, it was a couple of months before we got to take a shower. Um, so, but then things got better. Yeah. As time went on and things got established. And, and then, then they had regular chow hall facilities set up at all these little fobs, forward operating bases. Yeah. And uh, boys, like, you know, they made sure they fed us good because, like, when your last meal, that's what we would always joke about. <laughs> really? Especially if you were going out on some mission, they'd always have you have steak and lobster. Yeah, um yeah i i've I, i've heard some stuff on uh you know the steak and lobster man oh, yeah. and, uh, and some... you could go through the line as many times as you want not like back at, at, at regular training you know you can only get one job that's it yeah they ain't letting you get anymore 
<laughs> Holy shit, man. Um, your, your, your tour's over. You get back home from this. Where are you stationed? Well, after the first one? In 07 on your final tour. Oh, the, over oh, the there. final one. Well, I left about a couple months early because I had got selected to be for, for promotion to E9, which was Master General Reserve. And they needed me at the next duty station. Okay. So they, well, it's amazing how fast they can get you back to the States when they really want you back there. Really? Because I got the hell out of there in like a week. No shit. Home and I was back in the United States and got promoted and moved on to Washington, D.C., Green Bear, where I was in charge of the MCI company, which was the company that wrote all the manuals for the, the different job fields out in Marine Corps. Really? Yeah. So that was my job title I was supervising everybody and i wrote a couple manuals while i was there no shit anything good well the, the new we got we were just uh getting the new howitzer the m triple seven howitzer okay so we had to write a manual for that and so i got that done but that took a while but we were already using it before by the time the damn manual got out but <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then i also helped out in the uh ceremony of parades at the barracks Nice. Which, which are every Friday during the summer, spring and summer. And promoted to master gunnery sergeant. When did you move into the Pentagon? Uh, 2000 and 2012, yeah. 2012. Yeah. I, finished, I did my three years at the barracks, and then they needed somebody right across the street, right? You know, just go across the Potomac. And work in the Pentagon. I'm like, okay, I'll go do that. Because uh, it was either that or go to Camp Pendleton, and I did not want to go to California. <laughs> <laughs> so, if I know you, brother, <laughs> Cali's not on your list. No, it's not. <laughs> um, Wait. what kind of uh, what was your main gig in the Pentagon? Oh, it was uh, plans, policies, and operations. So each MOS had a representative, an E9 representative there. Okay. And you, you're pretty much monitoring your whole MOS as far as needs. Not not manpower. That's that's what the uh, uh, MOS monitor's job is. He makes sure that the right amount of 08 11s are here and there and 08 4 4s, for, you know, the different job specialties inside artillery. But for me at, at the Pentagon was like, like I said, it's plans, policies, and operations. So we kept track of where everything was as far as equipment and personnel. And then if there was any policy changes, so I worked in the, in that cell, there was an E9 from every combat arms MOS. So there was a, a rep for recon, infantry, amphibious assault, tanks, and artillery. Amphibious assault. Man, yeah. that's, that's some badass shit right there. Well, they just got a new vehicle. Uh, so, but that took years and years. When, and, and we were part of the, all the meetings. Well, not me for the amphibious assault vehicle, but that, the rep there, he was going to all the meetings, talking to the, to the, to the, civilian companies that are going to get the contract to build these things and all that stuff. Mm. So that, that is in a sense what my job was at the Pentagon, just monitoring everything artillery wise. And like if something broke, a howitzer needed a part in, in uh, Iraq, uh, I would be tracking the, the purchasing and, and getting that gear over there to Iraq. Okay. How, did, how tight was everything in the pentagon after everything 9 11 and stuff like that when you got there like security wise it was pretty 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 gnarly tight you got to get a clearance done first of all to even get in the damn place yeah and then you get your card and they got and, and the security there is all civilian really yeah it was now not at that time now maybe during when the the, the plane crashed into the building i'm sure they had a military presence there guard yeah there, but for the most part it's grand Iceland. And the Pentagon is an interesting place if you've never been there. It's like twenty-seven thousand people work in there. Oh shit! And you don't you don't even need to leave there for nothing. There's everything in there. You can if you need to, re there's you could register your car there. You can, there's post office there. There's every fast food restaurant in that place that's exists. There's everything there. I I've never been there. You know, I've only seen the out outside of it and whatnot. But just to, it's like holy shit, man! Like 
all that shit's inside there. It's like a typical military base in some yeah, sense because there's it's always. It's a maze too. You, you gotta figure out what wing to go down to get to where. Hmm. You, you can get lost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So you first start off working the Pentagon. How often did you get lost? <laughs> oh, uh, I, I stick to this to the main route for quite a while until I got there, and then I, I found out where better parking was, and then special parking for motorcycles. And I had to go into a different entrance. There's an entrance for they have a whole big gym in there. Yeah, it's crazy. The gym is insane. Uh, they have a, a track that just hangs from the ceiling, so you can run around like a, a, a track, like at high school, and then swimming pools, and you know, we're, we're talking like you know treadmills. There's like a hundred of them. There's your tax dollars. Yeah. Well, they want to make sure you stay in shape. Oh, God. But so we had, there was just different ways, but you know, it took a couple of weeks or whatever before I figured out how to get around this building. But That's you still true. would have to get instructions if you had to go find somebody and get, you know, well, where are you at? What wing? What, 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 what stairwell? What escalator do I get on? Oh, man. And everything's a pass key. You got to swipe your card to get in. In some places, yeah. you're not cleared for you. You won't open the door, you know. And if you're the last one out, you got to set the alarm and all that. Really? Yeah. None of that special, like, mm, scan in the eye. No, not, not, not where I was going. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many, how long were you there for in the Pentagon? Oh, just, uh, just over two years. Just over two years. I could have, it was a three year duty station, but, uh, I could have extended for another year. That would have put me in as 31 years in the Marine Corps, but I mm. just decided to go out. And you would think, you know, 30 is a long way. That's, that's a long time, bro. It's a long time. Let's dive into a little something, if you don't mind. Your personal thoughts on VA now. I've talked to a bunch of guys. I've got a buddy of mine. Waited years just to get hearing aids i mean you know i hear so many different stories like it takes fucking forever to be seen to be this to, to get this done to get that done i know you and i have talked many a times where you're heading to the va and whatnot and you know and stuff how are your thoughts on the way the process is now well, i think it's pretty good i don't particularly have i only had a couple issues and that was my doctor's fault yeah uh, I think you know, it all depends on who you get. I mean, you can have great people that uh, work the phones and take appointments outstanding, and then you got one person that's just lazy son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. He's never going to do no work for that kid. Um, and you always got to just explain yourself to them, and they'll, they'll work something out. Sometimes it does take a while to be, get an appointment, but nowadays you can go out in town and, and be seen. So my dealings here uh, it, with the VA have been fine. No problems. Um, it all depends where you go. I go to Daytona. Mm. I could easily get faster, maybe a little bit better service if I went to Lake Mona, which I can go at any time I want. Mm -hmm. That's a full blown hospital. Okay. Um, they can do everything there, you know, open heart surgery, whatever. At Daytona, they're just limited. So, it all depends on where you're going and how the people are there if, if you get treated well or fast enough. Yeah. And then, you know, if, like I had to have an eye appointment and they couldn't get me in for months and on end. And so they just scheduled me an appointment out in town. And I went to a civilian. And we see. So you can work things out to, yeah. they have programs out there. Some people just choose not to use them. Gotcha. And then complain. Hey, you can't get in for six more months. Well, go out in town. They got phone numbers to call. Yeah. You know, it might it take a, a little bit longer, like a, like a week longer. Because you, they, your doctor will, it's called community care. He'll farm you out to community care. So you could be seen by a doctor in the community that you live in. Well, they call them and then you got to wait for a phone call from that particular community care place. And then they'll set you up something. And that usually takes a week, maybe. Mm -hmm. Now you can always go to the emergency room if you want. You know, if, you, if you're not feeling good, you're throwing up constantly and you can't wait to, for the morning time or whatever to see a doctor. Just go to any emergency room, and but you have two days uh, after being or going to the emergency room to call it in so to let them know that you went and made an emergency room visit. Because if you don't, you might get a bill in the mail. Gotcha. 
Okay. Uh, and I have gotten bills in the mail, but they were always taken care of because I called the place up and said, hey, I want your emergency room. And then they do whatever paperwork they got to do to make sure that the bill gets taken care of. One of the biggest things I like to talk about and is the mental health part. Coming back from your tours over in Iraq, how did you decompress? How did you mentally to to get to get right again to make sure like you well, know for me personally i was never wrong so uh, i didn't have none of that over there affected me one i no uh, no i'm perfectly fine and uh i don't need to go talk to nobody about my <laughs> yeah i'm perfectly happy with everything i don't got no dig on nightmares or nothing no ptsd uh, yeah. to deal with Zero. how many how many of your boys do you you reach out to that might have an issue that they're dealing with that you know you can you know give them some guidance and let them know that things are okay our unit was is pretty tight i mean we've already had uh three reunions hmm. bravo battery 110 has had three reunions already um the first one was the biggest, of course, and then not everybody has enough money to be able to travel and gallivant across the United States, wherever we decide to have it. Yeah. Like one was in Raleigh one year, and then another year it was in New Orleans. Um, but we, we had an agenda. We always, we would reserve a certain amount of rooms in a hotel. We all would stay there. And then we have you know, conference rooms or whatever are assigned to us. And we have, we have speakers come in and speak. And then anybody can get up and, and talk about what issues they might have, PTSD wise or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we're all there to talk about it. So it's been working out pretty well for us, I think. Yeah, man. That's, that's, I, to, to have that, you know, and to be able to reach out and get together with everybody, I think that's fantastic, yep. man. Yeah. And knowing like they're not alone, you know, you got, you, you got that brotherhood yep. that everlasting brotherhood and that's the thing that i love about military man is that everlasting brotherhood and we also got a facebook group page yeah and everybody gets on there like just this past year a bunch of them got together on their own in uh, new york i think it was new york city or did they go to philadelphia i can't remember but uh, I, I found out about that one too late so uh and that was for the marine corps birthday is what they did they got together and uh y'all better let me know next year damn it <laughs> <laughs> How, when you reach your boys and they reach back to you everybody is it hey gunny you know is it some of them call me by uh, the rank but most of us are all on, on first name basis. Yeah. So, yeah some of them just they won't let it never let it go they'll just call you by your rank but for the most part we all went by first names yeah yeah. Now most of the guys I didn't know their damn first name, so I, it's hard for me to remember everybody's <laughs> name. <laughs> yeah. Hey, shit! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or we got nicknames for everybody, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I was uh, one of the funny stories. I always uh, buddy behind like you know he's like you know he's like you know heavily tattooed. He's like, were you, were you this heavily tattooed when you were in the service? I said, actually, I said, I, I had all these tattoos on my arms, back and legs, but nothing on my neck and hands because you couldn't get in with any of that. And I said, <clears throat> I was uh, doing something and I hear Campbell and I'm like, yes, yeah, drill sergeant. I go running, you know, and boom. God damn. God damn i'm like yes drill sergeant he's like boy you got more ink in you than a ballpoint pen yeah. yes drill sergeant <laughs> you know but uh you know i've tattooed you mm -hmm. and i've known you for years and uh tattoos in the core is a big thing how yeah. how often would you you know want to leave or something like that go out gallivant with your boys and get inked up would you guys do it as like a a big thing well, when they first came out with the the tattoo new tattoo policy, let's say I want to say that was in 
It was after the first invasion, so it had to be around like 2004 or something like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they were really cutting down on the tattoos that you could get. Really? And so much so that uh, the policy was you could only get uh, one tattoo on your arms, if, anything for in PT gear, okay? So shorts and your, your green T-shirt. You could get as many tattoos you wanted that, 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 that covered up. Now, anything at your extremities after that, you could get one, but it, your hand had to be able to cover it up. So it only could be as, as big as your hand. And then once you got that one, you were not allowed to get an any more. Just one, and that's it. Sure. Um, so that when they and started enforcing that policy, they, what we had to do was go around and, and, and basically everybody show up to work at PT gear. And then we took body pictures. No way. And then that would go and uh, be entered in their page 11 in their in their service record book. So wherever that Marine went, the, the supervisors, could, you know, the CO, first sergeant, or whatnot, could just open up that guy's book and see what tattoos he already had and see if he got any more. But uh, <laughs> so I was an acting first sergeant for a uh, company at that time. And uh, I had the thumb drives and everything with all the tattoo stuff on it. And I just threw that stuff in the garbage. And <laughs> instead of taking it, instead of taking it to the admin and, and getting it entered, and I told my boys, I said, "You get what you want until you get to your next unit, because they're going to want to check your uh, your tattoos." And, and I said, "So you, you you got carte blanche right now." I said, "Who the hell was I to tell them not to get any tattoos?" You know, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> oh. I didn't like the policy myself. Oh man! So then we, uh, then when uh, General Amos became commandant, I was at. Uh, Green Barracks, D, uh, Washington, D.C., and he changed the uniform policy to where you know, your sleeves were always rolled down. Okay. So you, you, you camis, camouflage mm -hmm. utilities, your sleeves were always rolled down. You never rolled them up in the summertime. He just wanted sleeves rolled down. So nobody could see my arms. So I would just get tattoos then at, in the, in the uh, summer months when sleeves were, I mean, yeah, summer months because we would if we wore our Charlies, those were short sleeve shirts, so somebody could see your arms. So I just would get more of my tattoos done when we had those sleeves done to finish sleeving out my arms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, I, uh, I was stationed when one of the guys that was stationed with me, he did tattoos at his house. He had a tattoo parlor set up in his in a spare room in the house, and uh, I had him do a tattoo for me. And then somebody else said, "They seen." I was like, "Oh, wait, you got new ink?" I'm like, "No." Well, I didn't. It was, I know New Ink when I see New Ink, and that's New Ink. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, it was it was so funny when I went through, and I was, you know, I went to Fort Leonard Woods, Missouri, and uh, going through reception, and I was surprised at how much, you know, body art was involved. And there was a there was a guy I can't remember his name, but uh, he was one of the I guess I, I, on the medical end of things, you know. Uh, but he he had his unit patch tattooed on the back of his dome. Oh yeah, I was like, I'm sorry, man. I know that shit hurt, but. Uh, the easy thing to do is if you don't want to see you grow your hair and you're not going to see this tattoo, you know, but I mean, he had a fresh cut, you know, and it was, it was short. Yeah, and that, that, none of that, the Marine Corps, you know, oh, get away with that shit. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> you, what was it like for, for you to step down and retire from the Marines? Yeah. It was just time to go. It's just time to go. Time to go. Time to get down here to Florida and, and enjoy uh, my time off. Really? Yep. Yeah, it's pretty seamless for me. Yeah. Yep. Any, uh, is there anything that you look back on that you wish you would have done differently or, or, which you could have been a part of that you didn't have the chance to? No, no, except for, I, I really wanted to be a drill instructor, but you know, that wasn't in the cards. Mm. So and then that was already passed and done, but no, I accomplished just about everything. Uh, well, I, I tried to become a warrant officer, 
but that it, I never got picked. I, I put in for it three years in a row. I never got selected. You know, about 3,000 people apply, and they only pick 150 a year. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and there wasn't a, spe- a specific MOS that related as a warrant officer program that related to what I was already doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's even harder. I'm, I'm, I'm applying for a, a job in an MOS that I'm not doing, which somebody is already doing it. it that is an MOS or okay. that warrant officer bill to take over. So they're, you know, naturally they're going to pick that guy. They're going to go with the qualifications. Yeah. The guy that's been already doing this shit for, for 10 or 15 years or whatever. And then now they're just going to pin warrant officer bars on him. And he's just doing it at a different level with the same job. He already knows how to do that job. Yeah. Uh, I did apply for a job that did kind of relate. It was survey. They had survey officers that were officers. And I was already working with survey equipment for laying the batteries in the officer. But mm. still, I didn't get picked. So. What, what made you want to put in for that? You could stay in longer. Pretty much guaranteed it to be in as long as you want to be in. As a warrant officer, yeah. If you're if you're at the higher ranks, you know you gotta be like a four or five, and then you you know they can they keep you in longer. Hmm. So I, I already knew I wanted to stay longer than twenty. I just didn't know how many. And I knew I figured if I got warrant officer, I could definitely stay past twenty. Because if you don't get promoted to certain ranks at a certain year mark, you they'll make you retire. So, but uh, I was prepare trying to prepare. Because to make it to master gunnery sergeant in my MOS is, is extremely difficult. Yeah. There's only there's only eight of well, I don't even know how many there is right now, but there was only eight out of about four thousand people. There's only eight master gunnery sergeants. Now. So you were one of eight. Yeah. That's a hell of a fucking of a you know that's a hell of an achievement, yeah, I man. Did, I did a percentage. It's like point zero four percent people make it to the, the master gunnery sergeant in the artillery community. Less than half a percent. Wow. It took me 24 years when I got it. <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's an accomplishment, man, that, you know, you, I mean, deep down inside, you got to be super proud of yourself to, to actually. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, I, then I, once I got that, I knew I was doing 30. And then just like me, when I was in the lower ranks, I, I look up at those master gunners and they're like, you know, well, get, take your old ass home and retire. Cause, cause in order for somebody else to get promoted, one of us old bastards had to retire. Right. And none of us were, all of us were wanting to stay in for 30. How old were you when you made it? To Master Gun? Yeah. Let's see, that was in 2008. So, I don't know, I'm doing the math. Uh, from eight to now is how many years? <laughs> so it's uh, about, I, were, I don't know, in my 40s. Yeah? Yeah. Well, let's see, I was 48 when I retired, go back six years, so I was 42. 42. Yeah. That's still young, bro. It's still young. Yeah, it doesn't matter going for six years. When wow. I retired. So people were waiting for six years for me to get the hell out. <laughs> Come on, go get the fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> but once you accept the promotion, you have to do two years. Yeah. Otherwise, if you don't, then you're not getting that paid retirement. Hmm. You'll get your retirement pay, but they'll, they'll do some sort of percent, weird percentage shit. You won't get the same amount. Yeah. You get less. So, shit. I didn't have to worry about that. <laughs> but you did it. You yeah. made it. You got six years of that in. And looking back, and you see some of the guys that were under you that you knew as they're making their way up the ranks. Any guidance, any help towards those boys to get to where they needed to go that you did? Oh yeah, we all helped each other out. Yeah. yeah. Well, most of, uh, we all knew each other in 10th Marines, um, you know, growing up from sergeants or staff sergeants up to where we are today. Uh, we, pretty much if you're an East Coast Marine, you stay there, you like the East Coast, you stay on the East Coast. It's the same with Camp Pendleton. They like the West Coast, they stay where they're at. Yeah. Um, it, it depends on what your rank is and in, in, in your unit that you're in. If they, you know, like I, I was at 10th Marines for 10 years straight um, in the same battalion. Really? Yeah, just moved around different jobs. That's all. 
different batteries and then before you know i i, I pr got promoted my way out of there <laughs> <laughs> and, and, oh. and uh so we all knew each other for years on end and we just move around like you know i i was a, a gunny and then the younger rank then i got promoted to the mass start and it went upstairs and started working and the other guy came in and filled my spot and it rotated like that until we all retired Jeez. Any major thing that stands out from your your time overseas <clears throat> in Iraq that you know that you were in in your motorcade doing that just pops in the mind right off the bat that you can remember? I was I was glad as shit that I became that convoy commander. Yeah, I got to do all that stuff that you know I did. I mean, it was pretty important stuff to me. Especially when you have a general that wants to get out of the convoy or get out of the vehicle and walk around and talk to people and shake hands. Like, get the hell back in the damn Humvee. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I, yeah. <clears throat> and that, that's the kind of general I had. He liked to talk to everybody. Yeah. Well, he was the mediator for with the with the mayor of Ramadi. We were there every day and, and, and they're all sitting in the in the mayor's office talking to, to city planners and all that stuff. And, how to get the city back on its feet and running and to get people to stop hating each other and shooting at each other, you know, the different sheets they you know, didn't like people. And uh, stuff like that. I had one interpreter that was a female and uh they they weren't happy with that. Mm -hmm. They didn't want her in, in the room at all. Yeah, they they're I I'm not a big fan of females. Yeah, they are not. So um I've asked this to a few people, so I'll ask you your take on the so-called weapons of mass destruction. Any any thoughts? We didn't come across anything, but that wasn't our mission. Yeah. Our mission was to provide artillery fire for, for the infantry and, and whoever else needs it. So we weren't out there looking for right. anything. Now, we did and consequently end up uh but that at one point on the initial invasion we put our tubes in the stove position it means we put our howitzers away we parked them in the motor pool and we didn't use them and we would do some patrols out in town or, or well we were around el coop so uh, saddam and his army had ammo cache points everywhere so uh sometimes we would thought uh, we'd find a, a big ass building full of ammo mm. We would take it all out of there and give it to the EOD guys and they would demolition it. No shit. Because we had to do that because the insurgents were going to these little weapon caches and getting more ammunition and stuff to blow us up with and shoot us. Yeah. So so you guys were almost kind of making yourselves your own 4th of July. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, man, they would make these big stockpiles and just blow it in place and it would be a big mushroom cloud you could see for miles. Really? Yeah. <laughs> man. I but just, all that stuff was old ass ammo. I didn't even really want to touch it. We had to. What, what kind of weaponry were they using that you, you've seen? Oh, a lot of RPGs. Yeah. And artillery shells. They would take artillery shells and turn them into IEDs. Oh, no shit. And they would wire them up to a cell phone, bury them in the road, and then blow them up when you go by. Man. Yeah, RPGs and artillery shells were, were, were made for IEDs. That's what we came across a lot. Yeah. So. And like you said, you, you, you had a bunch of guys that would do a pre-sweep before you guys would roll out. Would they? They weren't my people. They, no. they were, they were uh, a whole different unit. Most of the time, not even at the same base camp we were at. Yeah. They would just get, be in on the loop with the uh, planning process of day-to-day uh, -day missions. And most times I wouldn't even see them. They'd go out and sweep the area before we even left, you know? Wow. And then they would contact us to say they were done and there was, the route was clear and then we would go. All an ass. So we didn't, we didn't get any time to hide anything more, but occasionally they did. That's great, <clears throat> man. That's, that's, that's wild. Now, you're retired now. And you're out and about. You resided here in Florida. What do you, you know, what do you do with yourself in retirement? 
I mean, I know some of this, yeah. but you know, <laughs> I, you know, for my friends yeah. and, and our viewers hanging out and listening, I just and, ride my motorcycle every day. Yeah. In bar hop. In bar hop. Yep. Spending the good old retirement fund yes. on uh, the local. As, as, as I uh, refer to it, the Eagle shits in my account every first of every month. <laughs> <laughs> You're a Harley guy. And uh, I know living here in the state, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of fun activities that happen around October and whatnot. You got your bike tober fest and stuff. And do you, uh, do you ever meet up with some of your Marine buddies that come down to, to enjoy the festivities oh, with yeah, you? Yeah. I get up with them usually every spring rally. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny that you say that because the, the, uh, at first, I was a, a battery gunny and then a mass sergeant. And then my friend, he's the first sergeant. He was my first sergeant when I was a gunny. And then uh, I picked up mass sergeant, which was the same rank as his. And we were still in the same unit together. He was just at a higher level than me. And then uh, he got promoted to sergeant major. And then I got promoted to master gunny. And then I was stay. I wasn't. We were in Iraq at the same time, but not. But it, he was in charge of one unit, and I was in charge of another. And uh, so we ran into each other there. Well, then we both retired. And then I'm working for Todd's Tomatoes here in Florida, driving the truck, delivering to all the schools. And at Edgewater High School in Orlando, I'm delivering there. I'm there at like 5.30 in the morning delivering the vegetables and that. And I look, and here comes walking across the damn parking lot at 5.30 in the morning. Is my buddy, Sergeant Major buddy, that we were stationed, you know, twice together. He's the ROT, junior ROTC instructor at that high school. No shit. Yeah. And he lives in Mount Dora right now. And that's just wild. That I'm, I'm at a, just a bullshit job to keep myself busy at the time. And then I see him walking across the parking lot. That's wild shit. Yeah. <laughs> that. And he's that, a Harley guy too. That had to make you feel good, like oh, you yeah. know, just like a flashback of like, holy yeah, shit. Yeah, but man. you know, he's he still was maintaining the standards of the Marine Corps. Yeah, I eat a haircut and all that kind of business. And then uh, I I would stop in and see him in his classroom, right? When I I had time to kill deliveries or I was done with my deliveries, I'm gonna go stop to see you know Ray. And I walk in there, of course, I'm, I'm looking like this. <laughs> and then he's introducing me to his uh his 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 students. Uh, you know, they're all clean cut kids. And they're like, yeah, it's his master gun he's starting breaks. And they're like, What? Because all they're used to seeing anybody that's in the military high and tight, high and tight clean shape. <laughs> and I walk in looking like this. <laughs> oh. And then there there's there's a it's a surprising uh, amount of number of Marines that are not out, they work for me, they didn't retire live in florida some of them are in the tampa area st petersburg area there there must be at least 10 of them that's fantastic right here in florida. Yeah. Uh, i ran into a few of them we, we should probably get together more than we do but those guys got jobs yeah you know i'm out running around during the day and uh you know like i tried to get to go get some friends together to go for a, on a motorcycle ride last week and uh, those people the ones that were retired had honey do lists that they had to do at home, and the other <laughs> ones were still working. So I had to go ride by myself. So, you know. Now, you uh, you have kids, yeah, and uh, you were married at one point mm -hmm. during your career in the in the in the core. How did that affect your marriage? Well, I don't think it affected it at all. She was used to it from the get go. Yeah. And that's all the kids were used to. Uh, I wasn't home that early. So. Yeah. But they all, they all grew up fine. Everything's peach keen there, uh, except for my son. He, he's not married, but the other, the three daughters are all married. Uh, got kids. They're established. They got houses. Mm. You know, um, my son, he's not married yet. Though, so I, I, I don't know if he has a girlfriend at this point, but. Yeah, um, they're all well to do. It didn't, didn't seem to affect them adversely, at least not that they tell me. <laughs> yeah, and I've, I've you know I've I've seen some photos. Your grandfather, mm -hmm. 
How's it feel? Oh, good. I mean, I got what, six grandkids. Yeah. One daughter lives right here in, in uh, Astatula here in Florida. How's it, what's it feel like knowing, you know, that you're out now, okay, and you're, you're able to spend this time now, you, you know, you weren't around much for your kids, but to be there for your grandkids, how does that make you feel? Well, I don't see them all that often because the majority of everybody lives in Pennsylvania. Okay. That's where my two daughters are and my son. They, they live in Pennsylvania, all in the same neighborhood. <laughs> um, so I see them if they come down here to visit or, or, or if I'm going up there, but I, I don't go home too much anymore because uh, yeah. both my parents are deceased. And, okay. Um, I, I don't think I've been home in five, six years or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, so I don't see them that often. Gotcha. It is what it is. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia. Um, I couldn't even tell you the last time I've been up there. I driven through it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it was a few years back. I went to uh matter of fact, I went up to uh, New Hampshire and a uh, uh, buddy of mine had a garage up there. So I took my 50, 51 up there to, to do a motor swap because he had a speed shop. He's like, yeah, man, bring the car up here, man. We'll swap out the motor, put a tranny in it and everything. So I'm, you know, heading back home to Florida. So, you know, running 95 South from all the way up there down, yeah. you know, and my pops calls me. He's like, Hey, I want to come down and visit you. I says, well, you just so happen to be in luck because I'm on 95. Okay. Yeah. And I'm cutting through Philadelphia, but I'm not stopping. I said, if you want to come, I'll pick you up. So I was like, meet me at the exit on Armigo Avenue. Yeah. I said, I'll pull off. You jump in and right back on 95. <laughs> Dude, that's all I fucking did. I'm pulling this car trailer. It's like two o'clock in the morning. I think I pull off the highway and there's my dad with my nephew and Rome in the truck and <laughs> southbound. We went, man, I don't think I was in Philadelphia on the street standing for more than like a minute. Man. I was in and out, man, back on the road and out, man. But yeah, I, I, that's the last time I've actually been up there, I believe. But, uh, I, there's not much for me to go back to up there. You yeah. know, um, my wife, she's from California, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she hated California and whatnot. But I mean, it is what it is. And let me, the shit that's happening now overseas, what do you follow? Are you following any of this shit on the uh, news? No, not, not, no, just know that uh, we're, we're wasting our money over there. <laughs> in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. I don't follow it that greatly, but. I don't think we should be giving all these hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to these stupid countries. Yeah, I mean, you know, we got the whole Ukraine thing with Russia, and then, you know, we're dealing with, you know, the Gaza shit, you know, and whatnot. But, I mean, I, I think a lot of our money could be better off spent stateside and oh, yeah. other things. But I just, I don't understand why we're giving so much to that shit man yeah. yeah like you know the gaza stuff and all that those people have been fighting each other for three thousand years uh, yeah let them kill each other we don't need to get involved in that shit <laughs> yeah i it's it's just ridiculous and then we got these fucking kids in these schools and protesting this and that and and whatnot you know i i don't get political on my on my podcast I, I don't like to talk politics and shit like that you know everybody's got the right to free speech man say what you want to say you know but when it comes to destroying property yeah. and and taking so-called people and locking them in schools and shit like that then it's you're stepping over the line yeah. and and whatnot but yeah i mean i i agree with you i think our money could be spent better elsewhere yeah so but with with that all being said brother I, I i deeply appreciate you coming out hanging out with me today man and talking and whatnot it means a lot to me yeah, and sure. uh for anybody that's out there what would you say to them looking to get into the the core well it's it's a, it's a good thing i mean 
you know, obviously I can't get cigarettes. They, they're tired. You yeah. can't beat it, you know. When I see people that aren't doing very well, you know, you know, a lot of people say, yeah, I, I, I wanted to join, but. Yeah. And then I see people that, that live like shit and they don't have much. It's because it's the path they chose for one. And two, I know sometimes I just tell them, I said, you know, you had the opportunity. I am certain that a recruiter called your house or you a shitload of times. And you said, no, 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 nothing. And now look at where you got nothing. You know, everybody has the opportunity to join the service, whether it's for four years or for 30 years. It's, it's not a bad decision. It's not a bad deal. You know, so people said, uh, I don't want nobody to tell me what to do. I said, and I would tell them, even if you work for yourself, you're going to tell yourself what to do. Yeah. Somebody's going to tell you what to do. And I don't know. It's just when I see people that aren't doing, they're doing like, like shit and they, they had an opportunity, but they didn't want to take it. You know, because it's too lazy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But that's my take. I, you know, it's funny you say that because. I say this shit all the time, man. Today's kids don't know. They don't understand the way, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be 50 this year, but the way I grew up and I, you know, I grew up running the streets, mm -hmm. man, running around. We spent every fucking waking moment outside playing war, running through the woods, building forts, bottle caps or scully in the yeah. street and, yeah. and whatnot. And now it's, electronic devices vr and video games and whatnot but mm -hmm. you know i mean it is what it is yeah, i mean times have changed but get the fuck outside eat some dirt yeah. build those immunities <laughs> you know <laughs> that's the way i look at it yeah. but ed thanks again brother okay and no uh yeah man and for you guys listening i want to thank you guys so much for tuning in and uh love you guys peace